Welcome to this uh, R in Insurance webinar for January 2024 on behalf of the R Consortium R Adoption Series. Uh, the series will run for four consecutive weeks. And uh, in this today's topics, we will start with uh, some relatively uh, simple concepts. And as we progress, we will start building up on that. Um, uh, so for uh, for today's topics, we have uh, some thoughts and some ideas about how we could transition from Excel to into programming in R. And we will follow up uh, next week on how to uh, move from programming into R to putting R into production. And then in weeks three and four, we will capture performance culture topics. Uh, my name is Georges Bakalukas, and I will be covering the first two sessions and my colleague, uh, Benedict Schamberger, who I will uh, allow to, him to introduce himself in a bit, he will be covering the second two sessions. Um, I'm an actuary working for Swiss Re, and uh, I'm not a programmer from uh, an early age. I discovered programming six, seven years ago, and it transformed the way I was working from Excel into R, and that's, that's excitement. Hopefully I could pass on a little bit on that um, to, to some of you. Um, I'll pass on to Benedict for him to do this himself and we will continue with the webinar topic for today. Yeah, thank you very much, George. So, as I mentioned, I will cover sessions three and four in a few weeks time. And yeah, also nice to meet you. I'm Benedict, uh, I've also been working for Swiss Re for a few years. I guess maybe in contrast to George, uh, I've already started uh, my sort of journey with R in un at university and have successfully used it um, over my career since, mostly in data analysis and modeling jobs. So hopefully there's something for you to learn today. And I pass it back to George. Thank you very much, Benedict. So the the, the background to, to this is that within Swiss Re, we have a, a strong internal community, which has been sponsored for several years now. Uh, since 2019 by our group chief actually, Philip Long, uh, to adopt programming on our day-to-day. -day. And we have reached a level of around 2,000 people in the community with 500 regular coders that we support each other. Uh, one of the community uh, channels that we have is a Microsoft Teams community channel that people can ask questions. And the example we will use today is coming from one of the questions that came through this channel uh, several months ago. And I will talk into the topic in into the next, uh, next slide. I just uh, would like to clarify that any any expressed uh, views today are solely of the speakers rather than our uh, employer. So the, the running example for webinars one and two is that we have an insurer who covers the remaining balance of loans in case of death or disability for the borrower. And uh, they, they actually had to provide a quote for this insurer for a portfolio of too many A's here, circa 300,000 policies. And the, the insurer had given for each of the policies the loan amount, the loan duration, and the interest rate. So the immediate task for the actuary was to calculate the sum in suit profile for each of policies as it amortizes. So the more the client of the policy pays, the, the smaller the amount remaining balance. So if there is an accident or a death or a disability, the insurer will have to, to, to pay less. It's a, it's a job of the actuary to calculate that profile to arrive at the premium. Um, we will walk through a solution in Excel, which is the immediate uh, approach that I believe anyone in the industry would be quite comfortable with, and then we'll see a potential solution in R. In the second solution, second webinar, we'll see why some of the moving from Excel into R uh, trade off pays off. So, just to give it a little bit more of a background, what we mean about the life insurance code, this is a screenshot of the solution that we will step into in a bit in, in Excel, but I will just highlight a few things. Uh, in this table here, we have the balance of the loan of 1,000 at the beginning of the month. 
we assume that there is a loan for 36 months and every month there's an interest that is being paid and some of the payment goes towards reducing the principal and this is the balance that ends up at the end of the of the month which carries over here bop means beginning of period and eop means end of period and we can see how the balance runs off to, to zero amortizes uh, so immediately we see two two uh, challenges for for the actuary one is uh, given these yellow inputs how to calculate how much someone would be paying every month. And this is called the equivalent monthly payment. It's usually when you get a quote for buying a car or something, what would be paying for a month. And some of it goes from, um, um, and this is constant uh, every, every, every month. The second, the second challenge would be how to, to create this table where it amortizes, and we'll spend the next few, few minutes looking at that, and then we'll look at it in the Excel. Uh, so first of all, the solution to find the, the equivalent monthly premium, uh, uh, equivalent monthly installment is already there. If you Google it, you will find different interfaces. You can add some numbers and get the output. The question now is how someone can work on it on their own setup so they can add it for all these 300,000 policies and uh, also the mathematics about how to come up with a with a solution for the equivalent monthly income it's easy to to search online this is a formula and from when i was looking into that this was a very intuitive understanding of the interpretation so we'll take this as a given so we can move on on this short series of the webinar uh, so one thing to note is that this calculation that we need to do on the equivalent monthly payment, essentially applying a formula in Excel with all these inputs. It's quite similar to how we will do it in, in R. In R, we will use an assignment operator to assign values to variable. So this equivalent for this input. We need to calculate some intermediate steps, which is essentially the duration in months and the excuse me, and the monthly interest rate. And then we can apply this formula to calculate the, the equivalent monthly installment. <clears throat> if we step into some of these calculations, we'll see that the balance at the end of the period comprises of the balance at the beginning of the period, this F5 value, the interest that this balance is accruing minus this equivalent monthly income. I will I will uh, show you a next slide that shows the same calculation as before, but now instead of picking up the interest from from this column, I'm calculating on the fly by multiplying the balance again with the monthly interest rate for a reason that it will become obvious as we move ahead. And so this is a, a simple a simple formula that we can apply. The next challenge is how we can bring that formula down. And in Excel, usually you can link the cell or the next row with the cell of the previous row, and then you can drag down the formula. If you look at the, the formula view of the Excel file, you can see that essentially what emerges is that this is a recursive calculation where the the payment, the principal left at the end of the next time is equal to the principal at the previous time plus the interest rate applied to the principal of that previous time minus this equivalent monthly income. So we immediately see that the challenge that we have within within R is how we can translate that into, into coding. We saw previously how we calculate the EMI. Now, uh, some uh, small stepping back uh, to cover a few R concepts. So the first R concept is that uh, R supports vectorized calculations. And what we mean by that, assuming that we have two vectors, X and Y, if we want to add them together, we can use this plus symbol, which is a vectorized operator, and express the summing up 
of all the elements of X and Y in a simple succinct formula. We don't need to copy paste or drag down. It just appears once. Uh, now, vectorization is not always easy. Uh, a, a key, a key challenge is when we have values of a vector that depend on the previous value of the same vector. Uh, one solution, potential solution, is to explicitly create an iterative loop. I will not go into much detail of that. What I'm going to just note is that for each of the elements, the element, the j element would be the equivalent of the j element of the x and y. And then we have to iterate over the whole vector. It works, but it's often verbose. We have to write a lot of code. And sometimes it's not clear to see what is the, the content of, of the of the calculation. So it's it's it motivates us to try to find the most succinct way to express this calculation. Uh, so one one way is to find the most succinct calculation is to use recursion. Uh, we'll end up using these recursive functions reduce and accumulate, but to warm us up, we'll start with sum and cumulative sum, which might be more familiar uh, to people, but they also can be considered special cases. Um, so uh, starting with the plus symbol here, this is a binary operator for addition. If you sum one plus two, you get three. And under the hood, this is just another function. So if I use these special characters backticks to treat as a function, I can say add one and two. But this, because it's a binary function, it only accepts two arguments. I cannot use the plus symbol for one, two, and three. I get an error. I will then have to iterate and say, use the plus for one and two, and then use the plus for the number three and the result of these two. But this is covers of inconvenient. So thankfully we can avoid that because we have the sum function, which essentially does this recursion without us having to explicitly write it. So someone wrote the function sum in from the, the R core team that allows us to succinctly describe this. So it's a special case of a recursive calculation. And if I give another example for the cumulative sum, suppose that we have again one, two, three as a vector. If I want to calculate the cumulative sum, I will still have to say the first argument is the first element of the vector, the second is the first and the second, the third is the first, the second, the third. That's also cumbersome. But with cumulative sum, we can arrive at the same result. So where I'm getting with this, if we abstract away what the, the, the sum calculation does, and we use this reduce operator, essentially, if we apply the reduce operator as a concept to a specific instance, which is the function plus, then we can see that we can get the same result as sum. It's just that we have to we have the flexibility with the reduce function to define which function we want to apply. And if we want to uh, use the cumulative sum set of sum, then we use this accumulate equals true, which is works like the cumulative sum. It just keeps all the intermediate values. And now, why this is relevant to our case? Um, but before we do that, uh, I will show you two alternatives for the reduce and accumulate that come from the pair package that have some uh, um, benefit compared to the base R functions when we are going to be using them in the second uh, webinar for production. Uh, uh, so some of the data output is more type is type stable. And we have some more consistent way of uh, expressing the arguments within the function. So uh, now let, let's do a couple of exercises. So the first exercise is to use the accumulate and define the function. The function is a squared plus b and use the function iteratively successively on these two, three and five. So according to our uh, definition of accumulate, the data is x, the vector, and the function is a function. So we can see how this works. The first argument is the result of the previous application. So essentially, 
when we start is just two. So essentially we have nothing plus two and then we have two. And then for the second argument, we have the previous, which is the two, two to the power of two, four, plus three, seven. And then we have seven to the power of two, 49 plus five, 54. So we can see how any, any function can be calculated with this uh, accumulate recursively. Uh, let's make a little more difficult exercise. Now we don't have a function with two arguments like we have here A and B, we just have one argument. And instead of having a vector like we had here, we had just one value. So essentially we have a single value and we have to iteratively apply a function to this single value. So the accumulate function again, uh, we will allow us to define an initial value X, which is this two, and apply it for the length minus one times. And again, we see that we have the two to the power of two becomes four to the power of two, 16, and so forth, so forth. So we can see that this accumulate can work for a single value and a function with one argument. Now, if we go back to the data that we used before, the inputs that we had, and we have already defined or observed from using at the Excel file, what is the, the value of the loan, which is the previous value plus the interest minus the equivalent monthly installment for what each of the next one. I will translate that as a function. And I have only one argument, this PNSA, I'll call it A. And the argument B, I'm not defining it because I'm gonna use it. So it's A plus A times I minus DMI. And if I use this function onto the data set that has the length of my arguments minus one, using the initial value as A, I get the output that matches the output of the uh, Excel file. So I believe I, I have sort solved this problem as well. So if I put it all together, what I hear is I have a data and parameter inputs, which is A, then years, in the in interest in years, the intermediate calculations, which are the monthly, uh, the, the number of months, the monthly interest rate, and the this equivalent monthly installment. I'm defining the function, which I call it function three before, I will give you the more uh, evocative name, amortize. For, uh, for the loan amount. And then I will apply this accumulate function over, over the results. Now, just to save myself up space, I will print the first six values. So uh, what uh, I observe from here is that many working patterns are common between Excel and R. And uh, the claim I'm making here is that it often pays off to switch mice and between spreadsheets, computing and programming. And apart from this space saving, uh, succinctly describing the is the the problem statement, um, the, really the the benefits are the, the scaling of the solution to several thousand or hundred of thousand lines without incurring any any bottleneck in the calculation, plus how to productionalize it, which will be what we'll cover next week. So, so this this webinar sets us up for some more advanced topics that we'll cover next week, and the the first topic would be how we can build functions over this logic so we can reuse them because we have three hundred thousand policies to uh, to apply. We don't want to copy paste it, and also abstract away the complexity. Once we have understood what the function does, we give it an evocative name. We don't have to look at it again unless we want to even to 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 understand uh, what's going on, and then we can use it as a building block. And then how we can iterate over all the data, and we saw in a, one example before how loops sometimes are uh, quite verbose. And for the iteration over the three hundred thousand data, we will use some functional programming approach, which again will allow us to succinctly describe what we need to do. And, and then 
we'll think about how to communicate that with others. So first of all, to other programmers. So quite often when we build a solution, we might want to share it with others. This essentially other programmers is uh, done by putting the functions into the package. So it's a programmer to programmer if you if you allow me to say interface or like we saw on the um, screenshot of the website I, I showed you before with the graphical user interface, you might want to expose it as a graphical user interface to, to cast someone that doesn't care about coding. And this can be done in our using the signing framework. Or you might be able to build something more sophisticated and then you want to create a computer to computer interface. So how can this function then instead of turning it into a package or a shiny application, how you can uh, expose as a web API. So uh, so the, in the next uh, week's webinar, we will build upon on this and show how, how all of this can happen. Um, uh, I, I, will, I will open for, for Q and A's in a minute. I just want to also make one more remark. Uh, Swiss Re joined the R consortium uh, two years ago. Uh, because we believe it helps us uh, protect our investment in open source and also allow us to, to learn from others in the industry. Um, I will note that the R Consortium has a strong membership from, from the pharmaceutical uh, companies who collaborate uh, on, on this technical aspect. And it uh, provides a lot of benefits to, to the R community, but also to the companies themselves. We have already started seeing benefits in uh, our in our membership as Swiss Re, uh, by inviting experts from the ACOSOP membership to our conferences and learning from each other. So I would uh, I would encourage uh, organizations, if you, uh, if you are planning to invest in R or you are already investing in R to consider joining the R consortium. And I'll just open now for, for Q and A's and I'll also invite uh, Benedict to join me for the Q and A session. We have a uh, few minutes uh, available on the official time but uh, both Benedict and myself are happy to stay longer for, for an informal chat or discussion around uh, what we have seen today. Thank you very much. I believe you can either type your questions or uh, potentially allow yourself to unmute. Is that an option? I see a symbol of the chat. Okay, yes, we can type the questions. Okay, I think a couple of questions are coming up. Um, um, I, will, I will read the first one. Hi there, from Francesca. Hi there, do you offer quality assurance support for colleagues who are coding in R and want to check their work? Uh, yes, we, we do offer. Um, and if you want to know more about the Atelier program, if you search online on the Atelier program and the name of our group chief actor, Philip Long, you will find a, an interview he gave to the Action Magazine a few months ago that described a little bit more our approach. Uh, first of all, we, we have a, a, an internal um, guidance, a best programming guidance note. Uh, essentially, we try to borrow ideas from the professional software industry uh, of how to apply and DevOps and DevSecOps practices. And quite often all this information is available, but the examples are not really written for, for our users in mind. So we have taken some of these best practices and we have uh, written examples that can be quite relevant, but we also run uh, more formal uh, code reviews and more formal live coding sessions where we, we interact with members over several months uh, on a weekly basis where we provide some feedback and, uh, and improvements of coding. And then we invite them to our internal uh, annual conference to present to the community. That's opportunity for them to build momentum 
and happy to pick up the conversation on this topic uh, outside the, the benefit as well. Uh, a question from George. Um, um, what are the benefits of using R versus Python? Why do you prefer R? And Noel also says, second, the R Python question. So we have an R and Python question here. Uh, I will, uh, I would say, use whatever you you prefer. Um, the reason I, I I personally prefer R is I discovered it when I was in university many years ago, but then I never used it because I remember I was even scared to uh, load it into to request it to be uh, put onto my machine uh, when I first joined Swiss 3. But then I accidentally discovered that whatever I could do in Excel, I could do in R. And because I already knew and all the material was there and the community was supporting, I, I became good at using it. And the community grew as it is. I believe that like in human languages, let's say in Switzerland, there are four formal languages. The questions between which language you use, it typically is a history question rather than uh, a question about, oh, what is in a vacuum considered the best programming language? But this is a very big topic and we can, we can always uh, discuss it in a bit more detail. I'm very happy to, to engage on that. Uh, will the slides from the presentation in the future ones be available? Yes, they will. Also the presentation I believe is recorded. Hi, do you have any challenges implementing our studio from an IT security perspective and also for hosting local signing apps? That's a very good question. Uh, um, we, uh, I, I, I prefer to allow Benedict to, to answer this question because that's uh, the topic of his expertise as well. Um, Benedict? Yeah, happy to give it a go. So, um, I believe uh, taking the two aspects of it, so, uh, I think we are very happy at Swiss Re that uh, for, let's say, a studio desktop and regular R on your computer or laptop, we have a good support from um, IT who go through some IT certification that makes sure that it's properly configured and secure from an IT security perspective uh, for use. Um, for uh, hosting Shiny apps, I think uh, more recently or more recent years, we are also um, managed to um, well get some of the um, POSIT or formerly our studio from the company um, products that allow us to uh, easily share shiny applications or photo documents or presentations like the one that George is currently showing on our server, um, also supported by uh, our, well, by a very small internal IT team who essentially make sure that the server is up and running and that uh, people can deploy, let's say, their shiny apps there and uh, it's available. and. Uh, as I think George already mentioned, this was you very valuable if there are some active R user community that helps guide uh, or helps um, um, motivate or formulate these requirements to your internal IT teams to make sure that they are heard and implemented as useful to the users. Thank you very much, Benedict. And as you rightly noted, this presentation was done in quarto published on our Talent Positive Connect and I'm sharing it live here. Uh, uh, um, a technical question on the topic at hand by Russell. In your accumulate example, how does R know what the previous value is? Do you need to ensure the data is sorted, grouped in a particular way? Um, that's a very good question. Yes, the, the data are sorted um, both in Excel and in R by the month which they have been occurred. So it's a, uh, would you be able to say time series? Yes, it's a, it, it's, it's a, an ordered data set. Absolutely. Um, uh, uh, okay, um, Fran Federica, could you highlight a few key advantages of transitioning to R for these tasks? Um, I think if the simple task for this one is just like one task and you can build it in a, quickly in Excel, that's that's a very good stop. In this specific case, the person that was doing it had to run 300,000 policies on it and also not just once. 
uh, usually when you run uh, to produce some cash flow analysis, you might have to use different bases. Essentially, you might have to have a, a best estimate uh, basis, some more uh, uh, prudent basis, some basis that the, the regulators are are requesting you. And by basis, I mean different scenarios on the parameters that influence the calculation. So each run might be five or six or seven parallel runs of these 100,000 policies. And then it becomes quite time consuming. Uh, the other benefits would would also show on the on the next weeks how you can put into production and and share it more more professionally. Um, I hope that covers uh, uh, Federica, but please feel free to approach later for more questions. Uh, I will ask. I like to ask uh, Benedict to respond to the does an object oriented approach help developing your programs in R or is it unnecessary, uh, Benedict? Um, I think that's a very good question and maybe also lightly touches upon the R versus Python one. So, uh, broadly speaking, it's probably a question of style. Um, I mean, I personally, well, it also depends on how intimately you know R, but uh, broadly speaking, I think what George has um, shown today is a more sort of functional uh, style and less an object-oriented one where you essentially say you want to apply a function over different objects or here like a vector of cash flows and uh, want to get the results that way. And I think that is a style of programming that is uh, very well supported by R and that at least I found very helpful also for many um, um, well challenges or issues that I wanted to solve uh, in my work. So I definitely think that uh, of uh, sort of strictly or encapsulated object oriented approaches not necessary in R. But um, I would also think that depending on like you and the team you're working with, it could also be a valid choice to solve your problems. Thank you very much, Benedict. Um, uh, Gilles uh, asked, how long has there been a programming culture at Swiss Re, even for business people? Is it a fairly recent or it has been there for some time? Asking because there is no such culture at my company, any advice to make such transformation happen? Uh, I believe that uh, over several years, there are pockets. There have always been pockets of people that have been coding and programming. The, the Atelier program was kickstarted in 2019, late 2018, and was essentially... Uh, a program that was sponsored by our group chief actually, who have had just uh, joined as a group chief actually uh, on this role, previously in different role within Swiss Re. And uh, the discussion with the board was about how we can make sure that the actuaries are equipped with data science and communication skills. And we started quite quite slow and quite uh, basic uh, running workshops. Uh, in different locations and then the community grew. As Philip would say, people came out of the woodwork and actuaries are typically were problem solvers. And when we're doing Excel, we are almost programming. It's some people have written papers about how Excel is a, it's a um, what's called a, a complete programming language. Uh, uh, so, uh, so it's it's been focusing on the last five years, I think. Uh, but uh, if you want to implement something similar to your to your company, uh, please feel free to reach out to us to to discuss in a bit more detail. But also, I believe the R consortium can also help the R membership to the R consortium could help because that's the catal the catalyst for some of the intra intra company uh, collaboration. So please reach out, Zilis. Um, um, so, uh, Noel, this was a great introduction. Will it be available to see the recording so we can walk through on our own? Absolutely, yes. Um, now, um, now, Federica and Noel, uh, what motivated the decision to focus on the transition from Excel to R in the talks of insurance and actuarial science? Um, I, I will try to attempt to answer that, but also I'll invite Benedict to give his views here as well. Um, 
I believe uh, um, data science is, uh, is the confluence of information technology and statistics essentially and actually typically we come from a background of statistics and we we discover our university and we come to the office and we start working in excel and the functional style of r is quite similar to to the excel so it made the transition easier plus r is a language that doesn't require a lot of computer science background to get you started so, so I think it, people find it easy to get started. But I think the most important element is the community. I believe that uh, quite often uh, our users are not professional programmers, so they have a domain expertise and also are using R to get their job done. And quite often they are getting paid in order to communicate their insights rather than build a solution that it will be just judged on how fast it runs or how little fewer bugs it has. So the, the production environment quite often for, for actuaries is the PDF report you prepare it. But still you have to be able to rerun it quickly when the data changes, to have a transparent way of demonstrating to a peer that there's a data provenance. So I think the, these elements are the ones that are the most uh, uh, striking in favor of, of, of using R. But I would also welcome Benedict to to give his own view. Yeah, I think that were very good examples. Uh, maybe also touching upon one point that will be part of the, uh, somewhat part of the seminar that I wrote later on is, um, I think there's also the the need or the, at least the want to be more efficient. So I think everyone enjoys to be able to do their work quickly and uh, have the results for their calculations quickly. So um, I think it's a uh, no um, particular secret that generally data volumes are increasing and the more they do, the less appropriate Excel may become for certain types of analysis. So I think like George mentioned, if you want to calculate something for one policy, that may be easy to implement in Excel, but if you want to do it for 300,000, that may be more cumbersome. I don't even know, I don't think that Excel supports 300,000 tabs that you can copy over or anything like that. Um, and I mean, like real examples from my work was uh, like a very skilled uh, um, colleague of mine was doing a calculation in Excel and was just refreshing the sheet to get the new result and was taking a while. And in the meantime, I uh, created a sort of equivalent calculation in R and I had the result before he did from starting from scratch when he was just refreshing calculation. And it's like, situations like these, these that uh, where people see, oh, they could be more effective if they um, transition their work. And, uh, I hope this also covers uh, Noel's questions as well. Um, so we have a uh, zero inbox of, of questions, but we had uh, many questions, uh, which was uh, very, very happy to, uh, to attempt to answer. Um, we are eight, nine minutes over time, but that's fine because we 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 thought we might be and we will be happy to to stay a few a few minutes longer if there is any 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 question or Bill has come up with a question, um, and uh, so we will uh, we will answer this and maybe I would suggest that we we close afterwards if there is no other question coming up before we answer this. Um, uh, how do you manage analyst access to packages and any limitation on which package is allowed? It's a very excellent topic. I would prefer Benedict to give an answer on that. Uh, mine might be with a lot of emotion. So, Benedict. Yeah, and I guess the, the different angles to this question as well. I think one typical angle is the one of, um, since let's say the packages may just be a different person writing some codes. How do you really know it's doing what it's supposed to be doing, that there's no error or no random numbers that you get out of it. And I think that's probably um, more challenging if you go into, uh, let's say, areas that are not as well supported by the community. So essentially, you have some very expert, small niche area where there may not be as much of a community that uh, sort of peer reviews these open source packages and build some confidence over time that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. And um, I think, yeah, that's that's 
more challenging and um it then i guess depends on you on what kind of um trust and responsibility and testing you have done with the package in order to verify yourself whether you trust it or not and its results i think more broadly speaking there are thankfully many very well um, used and um we saw um or many packages that get receive a lot of feedback and uh maybe on github and you can see the issues and you know that they are used uh, by millions of people over the world uh, by millions of people over the world so you would actually be able to see that they are widely used and you can also see the source code and probably trust them more than some proprietary software by some company that uh, says that they have checked it but you don't really know how well they have checked it or whether they actually did um, so I guess that's one angle. The different angle, maybe from the IT, IT security perspective, again, um, that can can also be changing depending on your view. So clearly, with uh, with a commercial use at uh, our S three, you need to make sure that we don't um, violate any software patents. So we don't uh, make any use of software uh, against its uh, licensing agreement. Then I think what we also often employ uh, in our context is some sort of automatic scanning for rights uh, IT licenses and for um, potential vulnerabilities in software. However, I think we also have a relatively open approach. So while we have that sort of created or more well-managed set of packages, we also allow people, broadly speaking, uh, in some environments, allow people to also um, I guess, go out and use the package that they need on their own responsibility. Not sure, George, whether you wanted to add anything to that? Um, I just that a point of uh, the open source solutions are used by all the companies and by us on a daily basis. And we need to be able to find a way to, to, to utilize that otherwise. Uh, we cannot uh, essentially operate. So companies have come up with uh, solutions of scanning is one that you mentioned as well. Uh, we have a quite a strong and I would say robust digital governance framework within Swiss Re. Quite often what the challenge is, is that although these frameworks have been created with the professional uh, infotech uh, uh, community in mind, uh, actually is or other R users sitting usually on the business front might not be able to access some of these tools or might not be able to have a, a guidance written in a way that can be adopted by them. So one of the challenges that we have faced in the community, in the community and we're trying to address is how we can bring the IT world and the business world closer together instead of operating two binary worlds with we are divided by Excel, we actually can coordinate and collaborate. And some of the examples we'll see next week with these web APIs, where the domain expert can create a model and then pass it on to an IT professional for a data and system integration. This go into, into solving those. So I believe these interactions and intersections are things that we can add value by working together. Not sure if uh, Bill, we answer your question, but or anyone else. But uh, feel free to uh, write either to Bennett or myself directly, or find us on LinkedIn, or communicate with the App Consortium, um, or hopefully to to see you again again next week. It has been uh, uh, also it would be quite helpful if you provide some of the feedback that uh, it would be requested for you because it will help us shape the the webinars and. Uh, improve the, the offering. Um, I, I would then suggest that we bring the meeting to a close now, and I would like to to thank you for your participation and for your for 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 spending time with us today. So thank you very much from my side. Goodbye. See you all next week. <laughs>